Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you, Philippe, for the introduction. Let me try to uh, put the presentation. There we go. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about United Technologies. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the digital transformation journey that Pratt & Whitney has been embarking on, of which I have the extreme pleasure of leading. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how uh, we partnered with the SO Systems to help us with that digital transformation journey. So a little bit about United Technologies. For those of you that aren't familiar with United Technologies, we are a global leader in building systems and aerospace industries. We're a, we have a very diverse portfolio. We invent, much like Dassault Systems, new and better ways to keep people safe, comfortable, productive, and on the move. And we do that um, through our broad portfolio and, and a lot of our different brands. So Pratt & Whitney um, is a global leader in aerospace engine design, manufacturing, and fielded support. Um, we have a very uh, diverse and global scale from a manufacturing standpoint. So we have 31 manufacturing sites that span around the globe. And if you look at um, the products and services and our value stream or our value chain, as uh, it was mentioned earlier, it's, it's very broad and it's very diverse. And from a manufacturing standpoint, just think about the global scale of how we manufacture parts to build the jet engines and how we use our global footprint to do that. So when we attempted to put our hands around, right, calming the chaos, we had to start with our manufacturing centers. And because we have so many manufacturing centers, it seemed like a very big task that we were about to embark on. So we had to shrink it down and uh, take smaller chunks. So the journey that I'm gonna show you today, it's, it's focused on starting with, with 10 of our manufacturing sites, but then it'll be able to be scalable and expand to all our other sites around the globe. So we talked about ready the ramp um, and ready to rate. From an aerospace and defense standpoint, all of you are pretty familiar with the last 25 years in aerospace has been pretty steady from a demand standpoint. Well, there wasn't very, uh, very many large surges in demand and because we didn't have that large surge in demand and we had infinite capacity from a local supply chain, there wasn't much that we couldn't do from a delivery standpoint. So we were happy doing what we were doing and we were set up from a business and manufacturing standpoint to manage that steady delivery stream. And then you bring in um, the gear turbofan engine, which is one of the most innovative markets and in, in engines on the market today, and the volume and the, the rate ramp requirements that that engine brought to Pratt & Whitney is, as you can see, exponential. So we're gonna be making more engines than we've ever made in the history of the company. And there was no way that we were gonna be able to be ready to support that type of rate ramp increase with our existing infrastructure and manufacturing processes. So we needed to innovate not only our products, but we needed to innovate our processes as well in order to prepare for the ramp. So if you take the ramp increase that we're embarking on, you take a 20 year, 25 year steady industry, and then you put on top of that industry 4.0 right, which is the cyber digital transformation of manufacturing. So we went from steam to electric and we went from electric to computers and now we're in the cyber digital space. And most of us, if you think about your manufacturing facility, when you walk into your manufacturing facility, does it look like a cyber digital workspace? Absolutely not, right? But we are challenged and those of us that are the leaders and the innovators in that area today, with Industry 4.0, we're challenged to make that transformation. So we're all embarking on that digital transformation together, and we have to understand as we embark on that digital transformation, who are we gonna partner with to help us, lead us through that transformation? So if you think about Pratt & Whitney and the large scale of our products and services, there was a lot of work that had to be done for us to prepare to be able to produce the volume of engines that we're required to produce in the next three to five years. We had to make sure that we uh, established our module assembly centers 
from a visibility connection standpoint. We had to make sure that we connected our logistics streams and our materials and our suppliers, right? And we had to get an integrated supply chain. We had to get a world-class distribution network to give us that global visibility and that global mobility. And once we got the infrastructure set, then we started focusing on the manufacturing piece. So we built the foundation, and then we transitioned into focus on manufacturing, which is what I'm responsible for, is a digital transformation for the manufacturing piece. So if you look at a value stream transformation, it's very big and it's very broad, but we have to make sure that we pick the piece that's right for us. So depending on what it is that you manufacture and depending on where you are in the value stream, it depends on where you would start from a transformation standpoint. So Pratt & Whitney, we have a very broad uh, digital transformation strategy. We wanna take everything from product design or product requirements to product design through to manufacturing and then fielded service. And we wanna have all of that under that one seamless digital thread, right? To make sure that we're in line with that industry 4.0 cyber digital transformation. So that's our, our long-term vision. But how do you take the long-term vision and how do you start to implement it one step at a time with a phased approach? So what we did was we got together collectively and we chose to focus on the global operations piece. Because as a uh, innovative design manufacturer and fielded support company, we wanted to focus on the manufacturer piece. And if we can get the manufacturer piece right, then we can roll out and easily expand to the design and the fielded service and support, right? But we wanted to go at the heart of what it is that we do, which is manufacturing. So we focused our value stream transformation efforts on the build piece of our global operations while we have parallel streams running in the other areas and at the end, we're all gonna collectively meet in the middle with that one seamless digital thread. So you look at what does that take when you develop a strategy to have your digital transformation journey. So you have to understand from a business standpoint that our 20 year manufacturing processes may not be up to speed, right? To help us get the right part to the right place at the right time at the right cost. So we have to significantly change the way that we do business from a business transformation and a business process re-engineering standpoint. So we focused on the business. We did a few maturity assessments to understand what our current state was. We went out and we did several benchmarking opportunities where we went to a bunch of different industries outside of aerospace and defense to see what everybody else was doing from a manufacturing standpoint and if there was any lessons learned. And it was when we were doing those benchmarking activities that we learned about Industry 4.0 and we learned about DMDII and we went to a couple of those innovation institutes and we saw what the future of manufacturing was and what we realized that the future of manufacturing isn't the future of manufacturing, it's here. We're just a little bit late to get there. So now that I understood the maturity of where I was, which was pretty immature because I could have afforded to be immature from a manufacturing standpoint, then I looked at what the mature manufacturers were doing, right? And I realized I had a very big gap that I had to close. But I don't have very much time to do it because I've got that ramp, right? But once you come up with that strategy on how you're gonna transform the business, you have to make sure that you have a solution or a system in place to support that need, right? So we partnered with our IT organization and we worked very well collaboratively together. I know you think IT and ops don't work collaboratively together, we did. So, <clears throat> little back door, no, no. So we worked very well together to come up and to align those strategies. Because once you transform the business, right, you have to transform the business in order to capitalize on the technology. You can't have the technology drive the business, the business has to drive the technology. Right? Innovation is built out of necessity. I had to change the way that I do business, right? And I needed a solution and I needed a strategy that supported my transformation. So we aligned our business transformation requirements with our IT 
transformation requirements, and then now we have a strategic roadmap on how we're both gonna support each other instead of those independent silos. Whereas I have my roadmap and it's independent and, and divorce of our IT strategy. Your IT strategy has to be aligned with your business strategy. Once you get the business requirements and you get the IT support from a strategy standpoint and you align those, now you can filter down and find who it is that can support that need, right? So we defined our business requirements, we aligned that we needed to have a long-term strategy on how we're gonna automate and optimize our manufacturing and our infrastructure from an information technology standpoint. I was educated that we're transitioning from IT to DT, right? We're going from information technology to digital technology. So we wanted to make sure that we partnered with that strategy and that roadmap. And then we needed to find someone who was able to take us on that journey. So I'm significantly changing the way I'm doing business. We have a roadmap from an IT standpoint to transform how it is that we're supporting the business from a cyber digital standpoint. And now we needed a solution provider that was able to do that. So if you look back to here, what I wanted to make sure of was the solution provider that we picked wasn't an independent point solution provider. Because I had a strategy to take me from customer demand all the way through to fielded service. So it does me no good to have a fielded service solution and a customer demand solution and a build and manufacture solution and an engineering solution and a quality solution. I needed to make sure that from a strategy standpoint, we had a comprehensive solution that could take us through that entire enterprise transformation. <clears throat> so with that in mind, we defined our requirements, we defined our strategy and our roadmap on how our infrastructure was going to change, and then we selected a partner that was capable of growing with us and leading us and helping us through that transformation, which is why we're here today with Dassault Systems. So if you look at the project, when we talk about value stream transformation from a manufacturing standpoint, what does that mean, right? Basically, we want to enable the digital thread across our entire value stream. We have a global operations where we have uh, engine assembly, and then we have multiple plants and factories that supply parts and make parts in order for that engine to be assembled. So what I have to do is I have multiple customers, I have military customers, I have commercial customers, right? I have a, a highly synchronized global supply chain network. And then I needed to make sure that I was connected from a manufacturing and assembly standpoint. So I took the step to start the manufacturing and assembly piece and tie that into our global operations, knowing that collectively all the other groups are out doing parallel efforts to get us to that same global operations, seamless digital thread across our entire value stream that supports all of our customers. So breaking it down even further, what we did was we wanted to focus on four key tenets of what I needed to fix from a maturity standpoint across all my factories, starting with 10 factories. So in my 10 factories, what I wanted to do, right, was realize one of the biggest things was the planning and scheduling, right? So if you look at your production environment and you look at your shop floor, how do you plan and schedule production on a shop floor today? Do you do it in an optimized system that's digitally connected and tells you what the best thing to do is at any given time? Or are you running around with a spreadsheet trying to figure out what the best part to make next is? And then when something happens, you make a siloed independent decision on what to change, and then you find out two weeks later that that was a bad decision, right? So we want to make sure that we optimize our planning and scheduling on the production floor because I'm capacity constrained. I'm limited on resources and machines, right? And supply uh, in raw material. So how do I optimize around my current existing constrained factory that I already know is pretty immature from a process standpoint? So the only way that I can do that is to optimize my production planning and scheduling. 
So I wanted to make sure that we robusted that and we had an interactive planning and scheduling tool, right, that takes into account what all my constraints are, understands what my capacity is, and then allows me to do that real-time what-if scenario simulation so I can understand the impact of my decisions before I make them. What if this machine goes down? What if I change this part number instead of this part number? Right? And if I change a part number and I run a different part number, does that negatively impact somebody upstream or downstream from my processes? If you look at, um, just take the turbine blades that, that we make, <clears throat> for example, I have to go through five states in order to make one turbine blade because I have process steps in all five states. So if I'm in East Hartford, Connecticut, and I choose not to run one part number, what does that do to the guy in New York that's waiting for that part number? He opens his door and he gets a whole pallet of part numbers and it's not the part number he was expected to get because I chose to change the part number, right? So you have to understand and link your planning and scheduling across your entire value stream. So you understand when you're doing your schedule optimization, you're doing your schedule optimization for your entire production value stream. So you know the impact of the decisions before they're made. So it would have told me that I was gonna shut down my factory in New York and I probably shouldn't do that, right? So it tells me the impact of my decisions before they're made. So I wanted to go after planning and scheduling. I knew I needed planning and scheduling. Most importantly, you have to understand how you're doing from a manufacturing standpoint and the only way to do that is to get visibility into your process. How do you get visibility into your process? You have to look at your machines, right? Right now what we do is, is we go to our machines and we try to figure out what's, what's happening. Oh, the machine went down, why? Right, very reactive. And then we have these stale TPM schedules and preventative maintenance schedules that the vendor gave us and said that I'm supposed to service every 6,000 hours on this machine. How many of you buy a car and everybody drives the same car the same way? Right? Same in manufacturing. We don't use the same machines the same way when we manufacture. So of course the, the, uh, the, the machine right maintenance schedule, I may be using it and that standard schedule isn't working for me which is why my machines are breaking down all the time. I, wanted to, I needed to connect to my machines and I needed my machines to tell me what they were doing and that, that they were at risk of breaking down before they actually broke down. I wanted them to tell me what they were doing as opposed to me trying to figure out what they were doing. So instead of me trying to pull information from the factory, I wanted the factory to start giving me information. So I want to connect my machines so my machines tell me what they're doing. I want to connect my material. How many of you have factories, right? I have one factory that's over 1.5 million square feet in three buildings. And I have no idea. I have over 100,000 parts that flow through there with absolutely no visibility into any of them. So I needed to get visibility into my material. So once I connect my machines, and once I connect my material and I get that visibility, now I know exactly what I'm doing and how I'm doing and how I'm performing to plan. And now I tie those to my KPIs, right? My key performance metrics, and now I know how I'm performing to plan, and I link that back to my planning and scheduling tool, and now I can optimize my schedule based on how my performance is real time, right? So now I'm real time optimizing production scheduling on the factory floor and I'm real time linking it to my business objectives and my KPIs and I know the immediate impact on my business, on my bottom line, on my part cost, on my on time delivery, real time. No more downloads, no more Excel spreadsheets or reports. And then how do you tie that into a visual factory standpoint? <clears throat> Everybody's version of visual factory I'm sure is very different. A piece of paper up on a wall or a grease board in a factory is not visual factory as far as I'm concerned, right? Especially when you think about it in today's terms, industry 4.0, visual factory is not anything that's not cyber digital. So it's got to be cyber digital. So when you think about visual factory, how do I get visibility into my factory from a cyber, cyber digital standpoint? I say pick up your phones and your iPads and your tablets. That's visual factory, where I'm, I can see from my desk how my factory is performing. I get alerts on my phone 
when material's not moving when it's supposed to be moving or how it's supposed to be moving, or if a, ma a machine isn't running at the rate it's supposed to be running at. That's visual factory, changing the paradigm of the way that we think. And then when you have your entire value stream connected, only then can you really have a pull replenishment system. So for those of you that are lean, which is very close to my heart, you look at how we do manufacturing today. Most of us say we have a lean pull system, but it's all manual and it's really push. If you don't have a digitally and virtually connected enterprise, you can't have a pull system because it won't work. All you're doing is pushing upstream. So we wanted to attack planning and scheduling. We wanted to attack material and machine visibility, and we wanted to attack visual factory from a manufacturing standpoint. <coughs> We're starting it small because we wanted to take little pieces out of the elephant, right? Little bites out of the elephant. So we're starting with the 10 sites and we're understanding that our approach needs to be scalable and expandable as we learn and mature our processes, we'll then be able to mature and expand our approach. So what does that look like from a manufacturing standpoint? Again, I talked about what our manufacturing centers look like and I'm sure you guys some of you that I talked to last night share the same pain. Most of us are managing our factories with spreadsheets. We have multiple people running around with spreadsheets trying to figure out statuses of material, statuses of equipment. We're trying to do mobile production scheduling and, and priority rerouting, and it's very disruptive from a production standpoint. We're completely transforming that and we're automating that to where we get those real-time digital dashboards that tell us exactly what we're doing so I can eliminate all the manual spreadsheets. So my goal by mid-next year is to eliminate all paper off my factory floor. Can any of you imagine a factory floor with no paper? I can't. And I'm challenged to do it. And you should too. Manual and employee dependent. Think about the lost productivity and the lost labor hours where we're, we're asking our employees and our operators to document things as opposed to produce. I want to eliminate the paperwork and I want to eliminate all the manual documentation because I want my operators to focus on production. And I want my system to tell me how I'm performing. And if you look at the way we do business today with the multiple spreadsheets and, and everybody running around and we have competing priorities. When you have competing priorities, I have multiple customers and I have multiple engine manufacturers that I have to support. And if they all have a priority, right? They're all late and they all think their part is more important than everybody else's part. And then you can have people that go to different cells in your manufacturing plant and they tell you, don't run that part number, run this part number. Don't run that part number, run this one. Does that sound familiar? Don't do that, do this, right? Stop doing that, start doing this. That's mass chaos and confusion on a production environment. So what we want to do is we want to eliminate that and we want to make everybody independently responsible for their success. They're independently responsible for their success because they're not relying on other people or other information. They're not, um, being, they're not needing to be reprioritized. They're looking at the system, they're analyzing the information, and they're making decisions, so they're the sole owner of their success and their decisions. <clears throat> what does it look like from an operator standpoint? So if you break it down even simpler, because they say, Kim, I need it broken down simpler, I don't understand what this means. So I tried to break it down even simpler, right? You have multiple meetings, you have multiple people that get together every day and you do your production scheduling or your toolbox meetings. What we want to do is we want to eliminate all that. We want to eliminate all that wasted time and we want to focus on production. And if I have an optimized scheduling tool, right, that gives me that real-time dashboard that takes my capacity and constraint planning in, factored in and then gives me an optimized schedule, guess what? I'm no longer trying to figure out what to do and I don't need meetings to figure out what to do. I simply comply to what the system says is the best thing to do because I know because it's telling me, Kim, this is what you should do and this is the impact on the business, right? So I simply focus and I comply. And then if something goes wrong, which inevitably it does, I can do real-time what-if scenario simulation. This is how I think I should adjust. Is that a good or bad decision? Most of the time, right? It says, Kim, that's a bad decision. 
And then when I get to the right decision, I know I'm at the right decision because I know the impact on the business before I make those decisions. And then I'm <clears throat> not reacting to, to schedule disruptions anymore, right? So we talked about being agile and being ready and, and, and being capable of managing multiple disruptions on the factory floor, which are inevitable, right? If you have the right foundation and system in place and your system is connected and it's telling you how it's performing, you can now optimize and plan around that. And then you have, instead of the operator trying to figure out what path to take and what is the next best part to make, those decisions are made for him and he simply executes. And his time is now focused solely on production. How does that help you from a decision-making standpoint? So a lot of what we have done from a manufacturing standpoint is centered around hypothetical, theoretical, I think. I think if I do this, this is what the impact is going to be. I think if I do that, this is what the impact is going to be. And then two weeks after we make that decision, we get a report, we sit down with the boss, and we realize that was a terrible decision and what I thought didn't really happen, right? So now, what chance do I have to recover? I'm two weeks late. So it's significantly challenging from a recovery standpoint. So I wanted to make sure that my business impacts were well-defined, and I wanted to make sure that they were tied to the culture of peace from a manufacturing standpoint. So if I'm going to ask my operators to stop writing on 600 different pieces of paper what they're doing every day, and I want them to now watch a dashboard and react to that information on that dashboard and be able to realize what it is they're supposed to be doing based on that information, that's significantly changing the scope of their work. Tying your KPIs to your processes so you know exactly how your processes are performing and then making sure you do that human tie too, right? So you've got to address the change management and the culture piece of it. How is the job going to change for the, for the operator? How's the job going to change for the cell leader or the shop floor control or the production manager or the materials manager or the scheduler, right? Everybody's job is changing. That's business transformation and that's process redesign. So you link that process redesign to the KPIs. Chances are you've been monitoring the same KPIs for however many years. When your business changes and your process changes, your KPIs better change with them. You can't have stale KPIs. Your KPIs should be driving your business decisions and they should be live and linked and interactive as well as your system. <clears throat> so, as we embarked on this journey, we've been, I've been on it myself for about two years now. Um, definitely learned along the way, right? Because this is a journey. How many of you have lived through an industrial revolution? I sure haven't, right? So we are the disruptors. We are the early adopters, and we are the innovators in this digital transformation journey. So we all are learning this together, right? And that's why we're all here, hopefully, is to learn, share, and grow together. So one of the first things that I learned, right, was focusing the efforts to transform the way that we currently do business and capitalize on industry best practices. And I'll give you an example. I had a meeting and I says, okay guys, what are the requirements? And I got all the requirements and I says, now that I got the requirements of what everybody thinks they need, let's go out and look and see what everybody else is doing. And you know what they said? They're like, Kim, I don't need to look at what everybody else is doing. I know what I want. And you know what we want? We want what's on that spreadsheet. But that spreadsheet isn't what we need. So you have to understand that you don't know what you don't know. You know what's sitting in front of you and you've got to get out there and expose yourself to industry best practices in order to understand what you need and not just what you want. Lesson learned number one. <clears throat> Benchmarking and networking. So as I went out on my digital transformation journey and I started going to um, other factories and I started attending conferences and I was going to uh, um, innovation institutes, I was starting to build a network and I was starting to talk to people who shared the same issues that I shared 
and were going on the same journeys that I was going on. So we were able to now benchmark and network from each other, and we were able to identify um, through those activities solution providers that could help us on that journey. And we most certainly wanted to make sure that we partnered with a vendor, right, that was gonna be able to support that journey. So I have a strategy, a 2025 strategy from a business transformation standpoint. And I wanted a vendor that had that same type of strategy and that same growth potential that wanted to partner with me and help me through that journey. You have to address the culture piece from a people standpoint, because if you don't have the buy-in and the support from your executive leadership all the way down to the shop floor operator, your project is going to fail. Plain and simple. Address the culture piece up front. Address the business transformation piece up front. And then capital, find yourself a partner. And then capitalize on the technology and implement the solution. And you want to educate and communicate all the way through the process. So if you look at um, a closing thought, when I thought about leaving you with a closing thought, I want to make sure that everybody takes away from this that your digital transformation journey, the timing and the success of it, is contingent upon first transforming the way you currently do business. What does that mean? You have to have the foundation built in order to use the technology. Focus on the foundation. Don't focus on the foundation after you went and bought the technology. You gotta build that foundation. You gotta focus on the people in the process. Once you get the people in the process ready for that change, and you've defined what that change looks like, then you capitalize on the technology. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time.